In this episode of the BFR Better for Results podcast, we sit down and talk with Aljin Loki or Physique on Instagram, however you spell it. Anyways, he is one of the most popular artists that exist on the platform, and he disseminates research to help simplify the complexity associated with strength training and nutrition. I hope you enjoy the episode. What's up, what's up, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to the BFR Better for Results podcast with me, the human performance mechanic. And today I am very happy to have a chat with Aljin Loki, or as you may uh, have seen his art all over Instagram, uh, as Physique, although he spells it in, again, I still, and I've known him now for what, like at least know, four, four years. <laughs> Something like that. Crazy. Um, but I still can't remember how to spell his name or why he spelled his name that way. I know you've told me before, um, but really excited to to have you on. We've collaborated uh, on multiple di different projects and we're still collaborating on multiple different projects. And I wanted to have him on because he is uh, one of the most skilled artists I've seen at being able to communicate very complex topics uh, for a medium like Instagram. Um, so we're gonna get into talking all about art, how he's learned um, and all the different ways in which he's able to communicate fitness information to help simplify the complexity um, associated with the Instagram type market. So very excited for this conversation. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much for having me. And those were very kind words. Um, you spelled physique, right? So it's actually spelled physique because a lot of people kind of butcher the name because they cannot figure out how to spell it, but it's actually physique. And it's essentially, it's essentially um, a game of words between easy, so the word that means simple, and physique, the actual body. And it stands for trying to convey um, science or the development of uh, a muscle or body or like a uh, physique in an easy way, which mm -hmm. is done with the content that I try to create and share uh, on Instagram, which is my main medium. And uh, yeah, that's really uh, what it stands for. Okay, yeah, I'll hopefully remember it <laughs> next time. Remember it next time. Um, I just remember just typing your email. Uh, I'm like trying, I just can't even remember it. Um, so thank goodness for Google that has the little fill in the blank reminders. Um, but yeah, you're not the only person uh, that uh, <laughs> has sit up. No, <laughs> good, good, good. Um, so I guess tell, tell like the audience, um, how you got into doing, you know, this type of you know, content um, and what's your background and how you've gone about shoring yourself up in, in the fitness industry, which is, in my opinion, plagued by so much complexity or unneeded complexity. Um, mm -hmm. I agree. And, and, and fitness and nutrition. Well, it simply started back when I was, uh, what, 15, 16 years old. And really my goal was to lose body fat. I was a chubby kid at the time, and I was like, "How can I get like a better, a better looking physique that that I like, that I enjoy? Like maybe when wearing clothes, and you know, as simple as everybody else starts uh, exercising for." And from there, I really find found out that I enjoyed uh, reading books. I would literally devour uh, books from Lyle McDonald's in a matter of hours, and they were like very complex topics, yet I would like not be able to wait for the next book to come for how kind of hungry for knowledge I was uh, in terms of nutrition, because I was very curious on how the science of fat loss would work, which obviously over the years developed into exercising too. But what I discovered during that time was really that it's not necessarily about the fat loss that I was um, fundamentally curious about, but I noticed that I was 
here is more about how things work on a fundamental level, if that makes any sense. Like we can apply this to training, we can apply this to nutrition, but I was really curious about, okay, what's at the very bottom so that we can then build uh, from the ground up in terms of <clears throat> things that uh, can apply both to exercising and nutrition. <clears throat> and this is really um, what led me to the discovering of uh, first principle thinking, which is essentially in physics, like <clears throat> getting to the very fundamental uh, part of a given topic so that you're able to build up uh, in terms of the topics that build on top of it. So for example, in uh, nutrition, that can be, you know, fat loss works because of a calorie deficit. Then you build out with the macros and the calories and whether or not uh, different macronutrients play a bigger role into ca causing uh, a better fat loss or not. And, you know, that essentially uh, made me more curious about the whole scientific part and physiology of this whole thing, so to speak. So then obviously I got my certificates. I became a personal trainer and a certified nutritionist. And over the many, many years of working and simply uh, to keep learning, I was at a point in uh, 20, what was it? 17-ish where I started the page. It started as simple as me wanting to share my knowledge and my results really, uh, because I thought that I could be I could I could contribute to helping people out in simplifying things because a lot of the time people would like to sound complex simply for the sake of it, just to kind of sound more intelligent, which is something that I'm noticing trending right now as well. Uh, not necessarily in nutrition, but mainly in training now. But besides that, um, yeah, uh, that was really what uh, made me think about, okay, how can I convey uh, these topics in a very simple format. And I'll be honest, I tended to kind of get more complex over time. If I notice like my type of posts, they've gotten more complex, but I think that's also like part of maturity and simply like, you know, getting more uh, evidence-based over time uh, than I used to be like at the very beginning. But yeah, so I've always been a passionate uh, for both the science, but also for simply art and illustrations. Uh, I learned drawing when I was a little kid and, you know, didn't do any courses or something, but simply just practicing it over and over, I became simply better at it. So it was one day randomly, I was like, you know what, maybe I could try and put together both of my passions and see what happens. Little did I know that my page would blow up in a matter of uh, months and then obviously the following years. Uh, and yeah, that's really uh, how it started to become one of the, in my opinion, best fitness pages online. And, but as they say, with uh, such big pages come great responsibilities. So that's also what allowed me in a way to become even better at my craft because I would be more interested in bringing out the best kind of information that I could possibly get because I would feel the responsibility of that being um, very important for me because, you know, having so many eyes on the page would make me think that way. So this indirectly helped me become even better because I would be more rigorous with my research and my methodology of creating posts and trying to give as many answers as I can, but not uh, to the point where you're just at some point kind of speculating. So be honest about things, um, try to convey the most comprehensive posts on the topic, but also be wary that some things are yet to be known and that's totally fine too. So, yeah. So what's your, what's your process? So say, say like you, you're like, all right. Um, now, again, I know we're probably going to talk a little bit about the fitness stuff later, but let's just say, Let's just say your post is you want to talk about the benefits of lengthened partials. All okay. right. And for those uh, that are probably listening or watching watching this on YouTube or Spotify or whatever, um, they're going to probably know what we mean. But if you don't, lengthened partials just means that when you uh, you're exercising at the end range of motion where the muscle is theoretically on 
a stretch. So say you decide that that's the topic that you want to do. And I think you may even have a post already on this. Um, but what's your process? Take me through it. Okay. So first of all, in that case, I will try and read the evidence if there is any. And in this case, for the uh, LinkedIn partial, there actually is. So despite being, quote unquote, a trendy topic, it's not like one of those kind of trends that kind of die out. I actually believe there's a lot of merit into this. But what I would do is I would obviously, first of all, think of a thumbnail uh, of a post that could be interesting or at least that could uh, catch a lot of attention. Whether it's in the title or the actual image of the uh, thumbnail, it's very important because that's really what gets the person to swipe into the other to the carousel and read the rest of the post. Now, since it's sort of an um, advanced topic in a way, I would try and get the second slide uh, within a short amount of text to explain what uh, length and partials are, first of all, and then talk about their effectiveness. So. I would be uh, in the second slide would probably talk about what is the length and partial. So, um, so where, how do we define it? So it's, I would actually illustrate like the definition, therefore an exercise where the muscle is um, being placed under a lot of tension during its most stretched position. So it can be at the bottom of a bench press. And th then I would differentiate that from uh, the more, uh, shorten position and therefore add the text in both images. Then I would provide the evidence on the third slide and potentially uh, on the fourth slide, which is usually what I do. So it's usually four slides. On the fourth, I would kind of offer a sum up, like a summarizing type text where I would say, okay, this is what lengthened partials are. This is why they can be beneficial. And this is why, in my opinion, this is what you th should kind of think about depending on where you are in your training journey. Because obviously we're talking about a topic that is uh, quote unquote advanced, therefore it shouldn't apply to every single one of us, but rather like I would say maybe on the on intermediate uh, slash advanced type of population. But yeah, that's how we would go about it. How, how would you go? How long does that process take you? Um, so say like you already know, so say you don't know a topic and you want to familiarize right. yourself, obviously that's going to be longer, but if you already have a good idea of the evidence, what you want to do, what, what kind of are the limitations? Cause I'll say, I'll say like for me, it's, you know, it, it, it can vary. I mean, Instagram is just so frustrating just, just in general, cause you can spend, couple hours on a post and then get no traction make a mm. like i have a, a meme or a physical therapy meme that has gotten you know over a hundred and fifteen thousand views um already so it's just it, it just it's frustrating so i can only imagine yes. you have to hedge your you have to hedge your time wisely i'll be honest it can take me at least a couple of hours if i have everything ready but it really can take up to days, if not weeks, I would say, depending on the topic that I, on the topic that I'm kind of trying to learn about. If it's something that I don't know anything about, or maybe like a quote unquote new topic, I would definitely want to read a lot of research first before I can create a topic, because of the responsibility that I feel on the page that kind of has to have some level of standards so yeah it takes me a lot of time and it's probably the activity that takes most of my time during the day creating posts so what is so i mentioned two things number one you talked about the um the responsibility that you feel for having a page your size and what mm -hmm. that means so what what does that mean like to you and like what responsibility do you feel you have in the industry? Well, mm, I don't know if this is something like that I personally feel and it's just a me thing, but I don't know. I personally think that the more people or like, let me put it this way. If you have the opportunity 
to affect a lot of people with whatever posts you share, because a lot, a lot of people spend a lot of time on social media, then I would say you should spend that place or space very wisely. It's just something that has been engraved in me. I don't know, maybe growing up with uh, superhero comics and stuff uh, kind of brings me to the superhero mindset. But I don't know. I feel like that's the best way to, you know, also be uh, happy about what you're doing. And, you know, a little bit of, um, how I cannot think of the word in English. Like you're proud. You're proud of what you're doing. Therefore, you want to raise the, the standards of your products or content to the highest level possible. And yeah, it's just wanting myself to be better each and every time and this comes with uh, more practice and uh, with wanting to help more people and knowing that you're going to help more people you have to do it I, I feel like I have to be on that level otherwise I wouldn't deserve that no I think those are I think those are good points I mean for me I have a much smaller audience than than you and even so it's there's always things where I think about what message am I trying to convey? Because mm -hmm. anything that people, you know, anything you put out, people will associate with you for better or, or worse. True. And so I guess a lot of the posts that you do are, are trying to connect the research to practical applications. So a lot of people are going to be, you know, your posts can create actionable type change exactly. in people's routines and i think that that's a you know there's some accounts that are predominantly meme accounts where you basically are just posting something stupid and they really don't have a large influence on what they're doing on a day-to-day -day other than oh they can generate a, a little chuckle here and there um maybe even a laugh if it's if it's really good but generally then they move on but when you have a right page, like you do, it's, you know, you're, you're, you're basically breaking down concepts that are usually, you know, trendy in, in social media and people have a lot of attention on those topics. And as a result, you have the capacity to really meaningfully change how people are approaching their exercise routine. Right. Exactly. And I think that's a huge responsibility or at least like, it depends on what you kind of want to be known for in a way. If you have a meme page, it's totally fine, but you will be treated as such, quote unquote, by uh, the audience that has been following you for being a meme page. Mm -hmm. And that's, there's nothing wrong with that. But it depends on what do you want kind of to be followed for. So is it uh, a certain type of content? Is it like more science evidence-based type content is it for the illustrations uh or you can mix all of them together so it's really it depends on what uh you want to be known for uh, by the followers i, I do think. also think that um you have a particular style um so mm -hmm. kind of talk about how that style evolved for you and, you know, where do you kind of see yourself going with this particular, you know, artistic expression? That's a great question. So the, the reason why I started to make illustrations with the pink guy, which is essentially the pink figure that is featured in every single post of mine, is because so people could relate to it because it has no facial features it's just quote-unquote male quote-unquote female uh because they aren't actually they're like more alien type looking but it's so that it would not have feature features that would kind of um take you off from the attention of the actual post so essentially the figure of the person is there only to give you a glimpse of the idea that I, of what I'm talking about. But the text is what actually tells you the information. If it was like overly complicated uh, illustration, 
it would kind of confuse you a little bit if it would have too many details or stuff like that. Instead, I tried to be as um, essential as possible with the figures that I'm using and bring more information with the texts and try to fuse them together. So that's the reason why uh, my, the direction of my art has been going towards this direction. So always using a very simple figure, which in a way has helped also with the branding because doing this for over so many years, people will recognize Pink Eye, even if it's shared from other pages over Instagram or whatever social media, they will still know and reach out and say, hey, this person is using your posts without giving you credits or, you know. Well, well yeah, totally remember fun. remember when I said, I was like, you just got to put like a, a light watermark or something on it. So it's very, very, very difficult to, to lift off because people mm -hmm. will, I, I tend to think that people know that they should give credit, but for whatever reason, there's a lot of hesitancy to be able to do that. And ultimately that ends up affecting your brand because now people are leveraging the content that you've created to benefit themselves and they are, may or may not be familiarizing themselves with the message that you wanna give or picking mm -hmm. and choosing how they're gonna use your figures in their own posts. And as such, now your brand is associated with a messaging that you may or may not want. True, that's true. That's a good point. And, but you know, that's a little bit of the price that you got to pay for sharing content on social media. It's impossible to, how can I say, to kind of be away from uh, this stuff from happening. You cannot really oversee that. And, but just the fact that people will recognize the art is still important. And if it's not like a post that, I've, that for, for example, people have seen on my actual page, then, you know, you can be, you can think about the fact that maybe this post that was shared on another page with my illustrations, maybe it wasn't mine. So mm -hmm. it wasn't created by me and therefore it's not, it does not necessarily correlate with my own message. A lot of people reach out to use my illustrations and I never say no, I, uh, but just as a honesty part, I would like people to give credits uh, where credits are due, but some people do, some people don't. And that's really the reality of uh, social media. And I cannot do anything about it besides reporting every single page and every single post, but it takes forever. And my job takes forever already. So unless I can have like 48 hour days, I really cannot do anything about it. But yeah, um, just the power of branding, I think it's more than enough uh, because people uh, every single day reach out and tell me, uh, share pages that don't give credits to me. And they say, hey, uh, this page has uh, posted your post without giving you credit. So that's more than enough on my end. Yeah, so you it's mentioned it. like you have a lot going on. So what is your typical day-to-day -day <clears throat> look like? Are you personal training on the side? Is this your full online, you know, business? Take us through yes. a day. Fortunately for me, this uh, has allowed me to be, um, essentially this is my main job. So this is, uh, social media has allowed me to make my passion, my actual job. I am a personal trainer and I work with clients mainly online, actually only online. And, uh, yeah, that's part of my day-to-day -day part, uh, talking with clients, reaching out, uh, doing daily check-ins, creating uh, training programs, overseeing their nutrition, making adjustments to their nutritional part. But then we have the content creation part of the day, which takes most of my day. And then I have also the training that I have to do for myself, as well as the other projects that I work uh, on top of all these things, because... I produce eBooks that I have uh, on my website. I'm also working on an actual physical book uh, at the very same time. And then I create illustrations for other people, like including yourself and other people. And then I have to do the research, which is included in uh, the content creation part. Then I have to illustrate it. So yeah, it's uh, it's like a, not even nine to five job. It's even more, I would say. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it sounds... it. It sounds like it. I mean, you know, just judging 
by the breadth of the posts that you have on your Instagram, you know, we, you also talk about anatomy. So like, how, how are you going about studying the anatomy and then ultimately illustrating it, but creating it in such a way that simplifies a lot of the complexity? So how do you wrap your head around that? Well, first of all, I read a lot of books. So if I can find anything that is helpful for the goal that I'm trying to reach or topics that I uh, want to discuss, I try to find as many books as possible that I can read that are actually simple in nature. Uh, then I would do my research. So I would scroll through PubMed. I would uh, make some research there. I'll find papers that I would like to read. Then I, I would find correlated papers from those papers and try to put everything together or like summarize what are the main important parts here. And then really when it comes to creating the posts i try to be as efficient but also how can i kind of summarize what i'm trying to talk about in a way that a lot of people could understand because for example you made um, a point earlier about a meme that went viral essentially in your page and maybe that took the shorter shortest amount of time to make but that's also because the reason why it went viral is because a lot of people would uh, relate to it. So it's, mm. it's more understandable from a, a lot of people rather than the only quote unquote evidence-based uh, niche that is that only kind of comprises the people that are into the science and are actually able or want to dedicate the time to reading papers or getting like into the nitty gritty of uh, resistance exercise and nutrition. So this is also one reason why when you get very technical within posts, they usually tend not to be the greatest in terms of uh, mm -hmm. traction with likes or comments or, you know, uh, simply the audience uh, interacting with it. But that's also because they get very complex. So a lot of people cannot understand them or don't want to spend the time to actually understand them or read the papers that are maybe linked below or maybe they don't have the time. So if you can find a way to mimify those topics then they will probably get more traction simply because more people can relate it but at the same time you kind of have to decide because if you try to simplify topics too too much then you end up being a little bit um you end up using an oversimplification which then the nuance guy will come and tell you this is not accurate because and i love how you said it right. I love how you said the nuance guy, um, because it's it's usually a guy that is going to come on your page and is going to say, this is not correct, or this is correct only in certain circumstances, and tries to go all down this rabbit hole, and you're like, bro, it's, it's Instagram. <laughs> like, and And I think that's the biggest challenge for content creators, including myself, is how can you, and I've seen this by the way, in the watch time. So you don't post videos, but when you do post videos, you can see plotted on a nice graph, the percentage of people that view your content that view it all the way through. And it's interesting because even in that viral post, only about 30, two to 35% of the actual entire people that viewed the, the, the clip actually made it to the end. And when mm -hmm. I did another clip that was not, you know, it was like 30,000 views, something like that. Like it went, it was like 80%, but the video was only nine seconds. And I right. think what this is, is communicating to me in that it's understanding that long form content on Instagram is not gonna drive any serious engagement, but. It always depends. It depends and it really is, it, you know, because I view Instagram as, as a virtual, like inter almost interactive curriculum vitae, where you basically can get people to understand who you are, what you're about, your knowledge level, and everything through the content that you're producing. I also think yes. that 
when you're constantly serious or you're doing things, it's also not a good look because then it's like, you know, nobody wants a hard ass. And for me, I work with clients personally and not that I get a ton of clients from Instagram, but I do basically any client that, that comes to me, I'm like, hey, check out my Instagram. This is what I'm about. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. So I do think that it's, you know, Instagram, as much as we want the engagement, as much as we want the um, the likes, it's it's also important to for people that are building a, a business around that, which I want to talk about your business and how, you know, that's, that's been going and what you, what challenges you've had. Um, but that's all plays into the Instagram. What am I going to post? Because if you're, you mentioned this before, it's like, all right, well, if I'm only just for engagement farming and I just want to be polarizing, that's great. That's all fine and dandy, but that might not get you, you know, business that might just get you mm -hmm. followers for the sake of, of followers. Interaction. Yeah, I agree. And, uh, you know, it always comes down to, how can I say this? I definitely agree with the part where you said it works as a curriculum vitae, because that's exactly how it essentially worked for me um with getting uh, a deal with a publishing company they essentially didn't know me ever but based on the content that they saw on my page they were they just enjoyed what i would do and they they want to make a book with me so that's how it came out to be so yeah how long um, have you been in that process of of making this book oh man it's been already two years and no yes approximately two years and i'm still far from it but luckily for me, I'm working with people that uh, understand it, that have written books themselves. So they understand that the process is a very lengthy one. So they want to give me uh, the time that I need because I'm also, I'm also somebody who wants to be very precise about the content that is there, the illustrations and everything. So I want it to be as perfect as possible, but at the same time, try to deliver it within a time frame that, it's, that makes sense, essentially. But yeah, it's been a long time for me uh, and it's going to take a lot more time in my opinion, but I really want to do it well. Yeah. I mean, so talk to me if you can, you know, about how, you know, you're, you're, you've agreed to do a book. Great. What's the model that they've, you know, they, that you've agreed upon with that? Or did they pay you up front? Are you, are they paying you upon delivery? What, you know, because you mentioned the timeline and, and having a lot more to do. Um, and I've mm -hmm. never, you know, been been a approach to to create a book yet. And I don't know if I will, who knows? Um, but how is that process like for you? Well, it, it is as simple as uh, somebody reaching out from the agency and telling, um, you know, getting to know you a little bit. And then they offer you a contract with uh, usually um consists of um a payment up front which can be for just to get started essentially and then you get paid on royalties uh, depending on how many sales of the book you will do once it comes out now uh once you accept the contract you can also decide if you want an advancement but that advancement obviously needs to be repaid uh with the sales that the book is going to make so it's essentially um, as an advancement that should cover the time frame in which you're working for the book so that you can dedicate um, the time to actually working on it and deliver it as fast as possible. And this obviously changes depending on the authors. So if you're a renowned author, you will uh, get a bigger advancements and vice versa. But usually um, the main quote unquote uh, Part of the sale will come from the royalties, uh, which can range between, I don't know, 8% to 20, 30% ish of the book, of the total price. So that usually uh, comes down to, depending on how much the book will sell at the price, you would get that percentage uh, for yourself. Because obviously the printing of books costs a lot of money just to get it printed for the quality of the paper. Uh, to get it assembled and you want it to have a certain level of um, 
you know, even a touch and visual and everything for the paper that you're using. And also the longer the book is, usually the higher the quality of the book will be. So, so what yeah, what what is what is your book on? It's actually on hypertrophy and uh, a little bit of anatomy and also the nutritional part. So the first section is going to talk about the very nitty gritty part of hypertrophy from neural adaptation to understanding what a muscle fiber is, how motor unit, unit recruitment works, uh, then effort, then volume, then, then intensity, and you know all that stuff that kind of builds up from topic to topic. And then applying this in a more practical format and then seeing this work on the on the exercise part in which I will illustrate the exercises that, you know, uh, can be performed at the gym because it's mainly a bodybuilding type uh, book. So it will include most exercises that can be performed with uh, weights. Mm -hmm. And obviously I want to integrate that with a part of anatomy. So understanding like how muscles work, what functions do they have during X, Y, Z exercises. And then depending on how lengthy this will become, I can decide whether or not to include the nutritional part. Uh, but this is uh, something that I will be discussing with the publishing agency once I kind of have like a definitive length of the actual book with these two uh, kind of topics together. Because if it, if it exceeds like, let's say four or 500 pages just with those, then I would rather do that and then do a nutritional book by itself because I doubt anybody would read like a 900 book uh, mm -hmm. type bible you never yeah you never know i mean it gets it gets to your audience um if if that's what your True. audience demands um so <clears throat> who who have been your biggest uh mentors in in the space and how did you find them and what has the process been for you in terms of you know them shaping your thoughts and, and perspectives on exercise, nutrition, and, and everything in between? The, the first person that I can think of is probably Lyle McDonald, because that's the person whom I read the books from <clears throat> when I first started, and really what kind of shaped me into the evidence-based community. And yeah, I would say he's probably my biggest mentor and the first one. And uh, I'm very grateful for the knowledge that I've gathered from um, his book and his work that he's done over I don't know how many decades now uh, but yeah that's probably the the main person then I have obviously Brad Schoenfeld then I have Chris Bursley and all the evidence-based community I really see them as mentors because I learn a lot from them and they shape my uh, knowledge constantly and also the way I can communicate um, their research or you know the knowledge that is being um, talked about in a way that then I can kind of convey to the masses in a easier way in terms of uh, how I can break down this uh, complex topic in a more understandable way for the masses. So you, you've kind of played a little bit into my hand in the sense that um, we have, you know, very, <clears throat> Uh, you know, we have, we have two, two professionals, for example, uh, Brad Schoenfeld, uh, and Chris Beardsley and, you know, how do you, and how do you take their differing, I mean, I would say that they, they share similar, but also some differences in terms of the, uh, in terms of a lot of different things like like volume in terms of how hypertrophy happens like how do you rectify that in terms of trying to communicate what would normally you know what would be like evidence based kind of of work right so that's um that's a great question and i don't think there's there's really like a simple answer because even the answer probably doesn't exist to the precision that people expect it to be. So if we have various papers on volume or hypertrophy and we don't know the exact specific precise mechanisms uh, through which one or the other is conveyed, 
then we can try and be as objective as possible and then uh, be okay with the fact that we don't know everything about it. But for the moment, we can try and convey, uh, trying to explain this topic in the most recent research approved way. So if we're talking about volume, for example, then we can take a look at the meta-analysis, understand their limitations, but still provide like some sort of guidance. So if we have the latest, it's uh, Basval et al, 2022, I believe. And the recommendation for training volume uh, is 12 to 20 sets per week per muscle group. And those sets have to be hard, so hard sets. Now, is it accurate for everybody to stay within those ranges? Probably not, because it depends on your training experience. It depends on your time availability. It depends on your uh, perceived level of effort during the actual sets that you're performing. It, it uh, depends on the rest uh, period that you have between sets. So there are so many variables that play into uh, a single topic that it's really hard to be precise, but you can still use that as a general guideline and then try to mold that into your own um, practice because yeah, 12 to 20 sets is usually what I also recommend, but at the same time, does that work for everybody? Probably not. You want to start, if you're a beginner, you want to start with much less, perhaps trying to get a very strong base once you're able to recover from that, let's say a couple of uh, hard sets per week, then you can try and add more to the same week so that you can track the progress or, and you can be, um, you can actually track better how you're recovering, whether or not uh, it is working for the intended goal and whether or not it should make sense to increase up to a given point. Because uh, we also have to, um, because, yeah, I, I think of so many times, uh, so many things at the same time, because now you're kind of, in my mind, I'm thinking also the, the fact that we give these guidelines are very hard to um, try and differentiate them between, okay, does that mean that I can do 10 sets per, or actually 20 sets per session, or should is there should there be a cap at a, how much volume I can do within a session. And if we look at research, we have the one on frequency, for example, uh, of Brett Schoenfeld. We know that training a muscle at least twice per week is probably better than once per week. Therefore, if we can split the, the volume within two sessions during the same week, then we will probably experience better results. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, <clears throat> should those volume guidelines work for all the muscles at the same time? Because a normal training program will work all the muscle at the same time, unless it's like a very advanced type of block where you're trying to specialize into some muscles and bring those up. Then how can we confine those volume guidelines into all the muscles? And how much volume can we do on a single session? These are all quote unquote, semi-answered questions, but we definitely need more research. And yeah, it, despite people wanting like clear answers, it's really not that clear cut or binary, so to speak. And there are so many things that one person has to kind of put together when wanting to talk about uh, specific things, because we cannot think about volume alone without taking in consideration the intensity that we are training with or the frequency through which this volume is split between. They always work together and there are so many things that go around that, fatigue included. Yeah. So I mean, <clears throat> I'll give I'll play devil's advocate here. Um yes. I'm a I'm a person that's scrolling on Instagram and I happen to come across Brad Schoenfeld's posts and Chris Beardsley's posts. Now um Brad and Brad, I consider a mentor, um, you know, uh, to me personally, um, and we've collaborated on papers and everything. So, and Brad is the astute scholar. Um, but if you're a fitness, you know, in, enthusiast, here's where the dilemma happens, right? Because you have now um, Brad, who's publishing and everything and he's gotten you know the 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 evidence to to support his statements but brad is more of the higher volume camp 
And Brad also is has been involved with the length in partials um, in terms of showing that training a muscle at longer lengths tends to produce better results. Right. Right. So if you're a fitness enthusiast, you would say, all right, well, I need more volume, potentially, you know, 12 to 20 sets, maybe more. Right. As as if. And again, correct me if I'm wrong. As you get more and more training, you kind of mentioned it, that we may need more and more volume to be able to stimulate those adaptations. Right. So a fitness enthusiast would say, barring frequency, putting that aside right? Um, that we would probably want to train a muscle with higher volume at longer lengths. And as we get more trained, we want to increase that volume potentially, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then if you go and you're that same fitness influencer, or you're that same fitness uh, enthusiast, and you come across, you know, Chris Beardsley's work, and you don't know anything about him, but then you follow, you know, what he, his model of hypertrophy is, which is based on solely mechanical tension being the driver, which I do think that if you would put them both in a room, Brad would, would agree that mechanical tension is probably the, the main driver of muscle growth, not just metabolic stress and muscle damage, but right. you put Chris, we're saying, all right, mechanical tension is the sole driver. Okay, well then his explanation would say, all right, well, length and partials probably only work if you're actually getting a benefit from the length and position. What is the benefit? Well, you need to be able to have sarcomeres reach the descending limb in order to experience additional passive tension through tighten to be able to improve, to increase that um, that stretch mediated hypertrophy, which again, throwing in more terminology here, but basically differentiating that the length and partials probably only work because of that. And the muscle has to have leverage in that position. The muscle doesn't have leverage and is activated. Well, then we're not going to experience growth in the first place. Uh, not only that, their, their, their model is that that sarcomerogenesis, meaning the, the creation of new sarcomeres from a lengthened position exercise from a muscle that would experience that, right? So there's all these different, a little bit of complexity, but once you recognize that that sarcomerogenesis is a temporary process that tends to last, you know, eight to 12 weeks, right? So the beginning stages of that, well, then after that, length and partials shouldn't be a predominant form of exercise for an advanced lifter, because then you start to say, all right, the adaptation of stretch mediated hypertrophy is now gone because now you shifted the, the, um, you shifted the for the peak force that the muscle would experience. So like now it's adapted, right? So then you, on top of that though, you then have, well, as we get more trained, the model that Chris is proposing is saying that we actually might need to train less because now we're able to activate the muscle fibers more efficiently and the movement pattern has been grooved. So optimally when we're stimulating the top end of the motor unit pool, we're now getting optimal recruitment. So you then see this divergence where yes, mechanical tension is the driver, but then Chris is saying that, well, wait a second, like we might not need length and partials, at least as a law, as a majority of the exercise, but then you have the length and partial camp saying, actually, you know, muscles are growing regardless at the length and position. And then you have the volume debate where it's like, all right, as we get more trained, now we're needing more volume to stimulate adaptation, or we need less volume because now we're becoming more efficient at activating the muscle that we've you know, acquired. So you can see the, the, the issue that a fitness enthusiast could have when they see these two different influencers. And um, again, like they're technically different types of influencers because Brad has, you know, a PhD. He's extremely, extremely well published. But I will say that 
Chris is Chris's model makes intuitive sense for somebody right. who, you know, I'm intimately familiar with the model. And so it's like you get these divergent opinions. Where does some, where does that leave you knowing that you, you know, you follow both of them, but also how that influences your own art and what you're doing to promote information? Because as I just said, they kind of have a little bit of a divergence as you get more and more into the nuance of what they're what they're proposing. Well, I think um, that's the beauty of it all. Like, it's impossible to know everything, at least yet. We don't know everything. Therefore, if we gravitate towards polarizing influencers that, you know, break down things and say, this is exactly how it works, there, it's probably not the truth because we don't know if that's actually the truth, right? And the same thing for um, training a muscle in its lengthened position. We don't know everything about stress mediated hypertrophy. Therefore, if we try and build models, that's not necessarily what I would say it's the obvious truth because it's not. We don't have enough evidence for it yet to be as precise or as, you know. Uh, well, again, like not to cut you off, but like I'm I'm very much more uh, of a skeptic in general, but I do believe that having a model is a great starting point because if you don't have sure. a model how are you gonna how are you gonna try to support everything versus saying up oh, this works because this study showed this that study showed that so i i do believe that that is something that um you know should be commended but i will mm -hmm. say we have steroids right steroids yes. people grow muscle mass without taking you know without exercising purely from steroids so there, there, there's not just there's obviously confounders that exist within that model, but again, it ultimately goes back to, uh, I think, it it really is. It goes back to how are we conveying this information and who is the audience for mm -hmm. this information? And I, you know, as a passion of mine, obviously, this is the BFR Better for Results podcast. Better for results. What is better for results? Length and partials, more volume, less volume, whatever. But ultimately, it's really trying to get people to exercise more, even yes. if they need to exercise less, if that makes sense. Like they don't need as much volume. You know, you, you, I think you've done a, you did a post about that recent 52 set study that yeah. was done. And even though they kind of moved up volume, you know, uh, I think it was bi weekly or, or whatever. And yes, one, one group that. added four week, uh, four sets bi weekly. The other did six. They trained zero to two RAR uh, on one. And I think, I believe it was like two leg sessions. On one session, it was like very high effort, uh, low rep. The other session was higher rep uh, because they wanted to match like the level of intensity. So they also increased the load. And the results were that were not statistically significant, but they, there was a trend, to, uh, like a positive trend towards the higher volume being more like, quote unquote, hypertrophic. Not yeah, but, significant. but this is where it gets yeah. in the nuance, right? Like, and I yeah. had this discussion um, uh, also on this podcast in a previous episode um, with Milo Wolf, but they took measurements 72 hours post. So like what we do know is muscle damage and swelling could right. persist, especially when we're talking about that high volume, even though it was the second week of that, that high volume where True. I think we would have gotten a little bit more clarity had we waited seven days you know, right. to be able to do that. I mean, and, and, and as I said, I relate everything to the BFR literature and even in a high frequency BFR training uh, program where they're lifting light weights, but they're doing it, you know, to a high level of effort and or volitional fatigue, we get this super compensation effect that sometimes doesn't, doesn't even exist until 20 plus days following the cessation of the exercise. So even though we're seeing a trend, it would have been, very interesting if we waited an additional four days to see does that trend continue to persist and the groups separate 
or do they kind of clump together and it really gives us more information that maybe more volume is just wasting our time. Exactly, but that's the point, right? Even if there's like an increase, a uh, positive trend, how are you gonna be able to replicate that in a real time? I mean, in the real life scenarios, like maybe you can do it, um, you can do this many sets for a very specialized block, or maybe like even just like in a, in a type of way that you're essentially bringing all your training sets for the week or like for the block for a given muscle, reducing the amount of training that you're doing on other muscles, because at the end of the day, this is how these studies are done. They will train legs. And uh, that's really the, the goal of the study to provide, let's see if this many uh, sets in terms of volume are gonna be able to provide more growth for these muscles. But most people will train all muscles to a high-ish level of intensity. So that level of volume will never be uh, quote unquote, practical for them and even if it is you will be sore for i don't know one two weeks after that so how are you going to be able to replicate more volume uh based on those those type of sessions because they're very intense and also very voluminous so they're both variables that contribute to a lot of cns fatigue which is going to be detrimental quote unquote in the following sessions because you will not be able to stimulate the muscles to the highest degree which is important for hypertrophy. And to relate back to uh, the point that you were making earlier about Schoenfeld being more towards higher volume-ish while Beersley being less volume, I think the difference here lies into the level of effort that each, each type of kind of approach uh, follows. Because first of all, it shouldn't be binary, meaning that it's not either high volume or low volume. It really depends. It depends on how intensely you're training with your training sets. If you're doing a lot of sets and you're actually able to recover and even progress, chances are you're not going uh, as hard as you think as you think you are. And while instead, if you're actually progressing and doing a very low number of sets, chances are you are training very hard because we know from the meta regression from uh, Robinson at all uh, that was last year that yeah, the, the closer we get to fail yeah the preprint the closer we get to failure the highest the amount the higher the amount of hypertrophy that we get from the sets so there has to be an effort component to be met but we cannot do that when we train with high volume and this is also anecdotally we can see that up until a point we cannot really do even more sets because you're just sore all the time and when you're sore, you don't really, you're not able nor want to train as hard as you could or should because you're not capable of doing it. So is that actually optimal for you? Or are you trying to work with a variable, uh, working too much with one and too little with the other instead of putting them kind of on level where you can actually make progress and keep doing it over time? Yeah, and so, I mean, also we, that same meta regression showed that, you know, operating, you know, again, poking holes in different, in, in you know, different theories and, and approach is that we, they actually showed benefit as late as, as like eight RIR, like repetitions in reserve, which wouldn't fit with a hard model of the uh, stimulating reps or effective reps. Mm -hmm. So I do think that you know, again, like it's, it's extremely important for, for anybody that, you know, gets their information on Instagram. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's really important to have a healthy dose of skepticism with any information that's coming out of human trials. I think mm -hmm. that Instagram is made to be polarizing. And, sure. um, what I will say for, from both knowing both Chris and Brad um, on a personal level is that you have to take the totality, the totality of evidence exactly. and understand the limitations of each. And I, I do think that having a healthy dose of skepticism is, is really important and not digging, you know, too far into one, one reason or another um and that's why i'm i'm so happy that i'm not in the hypertrophy 
uh, I'm not in the hypertrophy uh, literature and I'm in the BFR is because I do think that having a model is important. And that's what I take away from um, Chris's work. But I also take away from Brad's work that, you know, everything is not as clear as it, it, it you know, as it, as it appears or, you know, mm -hmm. it, or, and it's not as sim nothing is ever as simple as we can explain one, we can explain one outcome, which is hypertrophy with one mechanism, which is mechanical stress, which is mechanical tension, which again, I think we would both agree that that is a very strong driver of muscle growth. Right. Uh, but personally, I think it's, it's the main driver, if not the only one. Because I mean, we well, that... from from physical exercise, at least. I mean, I yeah. think there was a recent paper that was looking at um, lactylation rates and showing that it really doesn't have an impact um, on prediction of of like growth. And there's other you know papers that kind of look at muscle damage and and metabolic stress, which again these may or may not create an environment for optimal growth via mechanical tension or whatever other mechanism. But I do think that as a, as a fitness enthusiast that we need to create or what, what needs to happen is creating actionable pieces of information. Now, at the end of the day, personally, I don't think that a lot of the, the nuance that we've just discussed is actually relevant to 99% of the people living in, you know, in humanity. I think that mm -hmm. this is a very small portion of people. And while I still think that it's super important that we're discussing these for science, at the end of the day, we just need to give practical recommendations for those exactly. that want to exercise. And I think that both of those figures, Brad and Chris do, you know, a job of saying, listen, we need to strength train, right? They might not fully agree with each other on some of the nuances, but ultimately are, are advocating for exercise as, you know, a, a way to improve the health. Um, well, I don't think um, that's a bad thing. Um, no, no, I, 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 I don't think, agree at all. I think it's great. It's just, yeah, it's just ultimately debating is like, like how we get forward and how we move and discover more things, like more answers. Um, but I also don't think they actually have, a, you know, I, I would disagree that uh, Brad actually thinks the high volume is, high volume is better. Is that really what he's um, trying to say? Because I don't think that's really the, the end goal. With I mean, yeah, there's the research paper published a couple years ago with the 40 plus sets. With He was the lead author there, I rem uh, if I remember. Yeah, correctly. no, I don't think I, when I say higher volume, right? I, I tend to, again, like my reference point is more Chris's you know, recommendation, which is definitely on the lower to moderate volume yeah. of closer to, you know, five to six sets per workout, which ends up being the lower threshold when you're the lower end of the uh, recommendation. Yeah. When yeah. you're hitting a muscle twice. So I would, I would say that the higher, you know, volume would be closer to, you know, a reasonable volume of 16 to 20 sets per, mm -hmm. per muscle per week. Um, so it's not ultra high volume. And I understand that the um, studies are done to kind of exaggerate. And I think it's exaggerate. And th th this is what people, I, I think, that don't actively participate in research understand or appreciate is that studies are done in humans to try to maximize the differences between the experimental group and the control group. So using right. designs that can actually try to sense that given that the exercise in general tends to have, you know, a low to moderate effect size, meaning that we need more subjects and thus we want to have a stimulus that's going to be as create the maximum amount of effects so we can get 
an effect size difference between the intervention group and the control group. I don't think a lot of people realize that. So they, re they read a paper that says, oh, 52 sets per week is gonna give you marginally non-significant improvements in growth, but then that's three hours in the gym. Like that's not, sure. that's not practical, but from a study looking to see, is there a volume relationship or a dose response relationship with muscle growth that study showed that there may be, maybe, you know, it, it's, it's a marginally non-significant benefit, but there is. And I think that that's exactly, that's the whole, that's the whole thing here where it's like, it's like you basically just don't want to be digging your, your, your foot into one camp. You want to appreciate the nuances associated with each of the positions and understand that like science is going is going to continually evolve and one thing i will say with with Brad is he has been the first to come out and say hey i don't think you know change positions uh based yeah. on the the evidence and i think that is a really important quality of somebody that is an influencer not only a scholar but you could say Brad is a social media influencer based on his followership and everything. Mm -hmm. He's not being afraid to be wrong. And I think um, that's comments. really the yeah. That's really the um, the quality of being a scientist. Um, it's not really about being right. It's about being less wrong over time. Mm -hmm. So nobody should be ashamed of changing position because science changes and. The more papers we find, the more we are able to change our stances. And there's really no shame to have uh, on that. Rather, it would be the opposite. If you wouldn't change stance simply because you identify with a position, then that's not being a scientist, in my opinion, because you're not following the evidence. You're rather, you're more attaching a, a position to your uh, own identity which, you know, it's not uh, objective in this regard. So I'm totally okay with it. And I think uh, maybe admitting uh, when you're wrong is also a good thing because so people learn Why not? that yeah, you know, I it's fine I think to admit it. People, people just dig in and they're like, this is the hill that I'm going to die on and so be yeah. it. And I think exactly. that having, that's where it ultimately goes back to, for me, a couple things. Number one, it's exercise as medicine. If you're doing some, it's better than doing none. Then nothing. How much, whatever. Those are all things that are small, minor details. Get to the gym, do some resistance exercise, work hard, couple sets of uh, per you know workout twice a week. Get some cardio in three to four times, twenty to thirty minutes to at least almost hit the recommended one hundred and fifty minutes of moderate uh, intensity exercise per week. But all this 100%. other stuff is all details that a very small percentage of the population actually cares about. And when you're dealing with Instagram, it's this feeds into the second where it's always have a healthy dose of skepticism and be willing to change your beliefs. And this kind of relates to me with the blood flow restriction uh, research where I was a part of a study that had a really surprising result about one of the cuff types that I was involved in. And I was like, all right, well, that's surprising. And that had to, you know, that followed me up where it's like, all right, I'm going to put my money where my mouth is and I'm going to do, I'm going to help fund a second study to look and see, hey, is this pattern evident in a different region of the body and if it is and if it does happen where it, it, there's a significant difference well then i'm gonna have to change my my um my uh my stance on the relevancy of personalized pressure for example so being able to determine the the per exact percentage of blood flow you're restricting and then percent and restricting a percentage of that right i think that that's important um but the evidence that we've currently done has suggested that it may or may not be. Um, but there was limitations to that study too. So having like a healthy dose of skepticism is really, really, really important. And I do feel 
that it is important on a third aspect to look at people and follow people that have conflicting or partially conflicting perspectives, because that's the only way that you're going to improve your blind spot. Exactly. I, otherwise, right. you would live in a in an echo chamber, and you wouldn't be able to grow from it because then you're only sharing your own personal opinion, and you know it's, it becomes like a circle jerk in a way. Well, that's where I want to end on with this: is what thing that you know you're very active on social media. What topic have you changed your perspective on that you thought one thing, and and now you you're kind of leaning into the opposite direction based on the recent, you know, any sort of recent findings in, in the research or happenings on Instagram? Well, it is probably the topic that you enjoy discussing a lot, which is uh, the science of pain. Because I remember like two-ish years ago, I was like making uh, a post on shoulder pain and I got called out by a physiotherapist called Adam Meekins, who is a great guy and uh I love uh, his posts and luckily for me, I'm not somebody who takes things personal. So actually the very next day, because I wasn't familiar with the science of pain and based on the only books that I would have read, like, you know, the kind of um, shortcut version of how pain uh, occurs and how you get injured at the gym, you know, that you find in the current or at least old uh, books on um, personal training stuff. Then I got called out. No, it's uh, shoulder pain doesn't really happen this way. And uh, chronic pain is a much different topic. Uh, now, the words used were more color, uh, uh, color uh, than uh, these. Of course, of course. <laughs> but, but I actually enjoyed it. And I was like, thank you for um, calling me out. And the very next day I made a post. Um, I read two books in the same night on the on the topic so that I can actually understand. Two books? Uh, yes, wow. I read um, mostly... Uh, explain pain okay yeah, yeah. i was gonna say book. if you're reading two books and they're not novels but they're like explain pain is one of those you can get through in a couple hours yeah yeah for sure it's not like huge huge books and they're filled with illustrations but at the same time there was a very good book because it really goes to the point on explaining what pain is and you know it's not like tedious to go through and really gets the message across so and I, I don't, cannot remember the title of the second one, but yeah, I really understood what it was about and that's where I changed my position. But at the same time, I admitted that I was wrong uh, in the very next day. So I believe a lot in the, uh, in the integrity. Um, so, you know, I, I'm never scared of admitting that I'm wrong and this is where I've changed my position and uh, learned a lot ever since. Wow. I also actually... Uh, collaborated with uh, Tom Walters, who is a rehab science yeah, yeah, yeah. on his book. And um, uh, I did a lot of illustration on the pain topic for his book. Oh, wow. That's cool. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Look yeah, at that. Is. Look at you. Well, let's wrap up. What, um, you know, what plugs you want to hit? What, you know, if people can find you, um, I would probably spell out your, your Instagram handle um, or anything else you yeah. find is relevant um, for the audience. So first of all, I would uh, want to summarize what we discussed about together. So in terms of training for hypertrophy, I think to, uh, uh, to lean towards higher volume, lower volume, it really depends. Uh, it depends on how hard you're training. Find a dose that you're comfortable with and progress within that. Train a couple of hard sets per week. If you can recover from those, then you can double throughout the same week. So in, a, in two sessions rather than one. So if, for example, you do an A session where you work your upper body for a couple of sets, let's say four to six, then you can try and double it two to three days after so that you're recovered and try to replicate it. As simple as that. Same goes for legs and see if you can progress over time. So instead of like kind of getting into the preciseness of how many sets I can do or how hard should I train, that's really it. Uh, focus on a couple number of sets per session, go as hard as you can comfortably go for all sets and then try to increase volume as you as you uh, progress doing uh, on a week to week basis. Um, but yeah, 
uh, with that said, uh, you can find my posts and my page uh, at physique on Instagram, which is spelled P H E A S Y Q U E. And uh, yeah, that's really it. Yeah. All right. Well, it's been a it's been a great episode. Uh, thank you for your time, and uh, everything else will be in the show notes. Thank you very much for having me. Of course, and that's the episode. And that was today's episode of the BFR Better for Results podcast. If you enjoyed the episode, I would love if you subscribe to the podcast on whatever platform you're watching or listening on. I really appreciate the support.